Blood is actually a mixture of cells suspended in a slightly yellowish liquid called plasma. Plasma is made up mostly of water, but it also contains proteins, sugars, hormones, and salts. The three different types of cells you'll find in plasma are red blood cells, or erythrocytes, white blood cells, or leukocytes, and platelets, or thrombocytes. Red blood cells give the blood its color and make up 40 to 45 percent of your blood. They're round and look a little like a donut without the hole in them. Their main job is to carry oxygen to the other cells of the body and to take away the carbon dioxide as a waste product. Red blood cells only live four months, but healthy bone marrow produces four to five billion red cells every hour to keep replenishing the ones that wear out. White blood cells, on the other hand, are the body's defense system. They all fight infection from bacteria, viruses, all those nasty microbes that can cause disease. Whenever germs begin to infect your body, they send out a signal that the granulocyte recognizes. Just as soon as the granulocyte detects the signal, it begins its journey to the site of the infection. When at last they find the invader germ, they quickly move in for the kill, first attacking the invader and then eating it. Something else that is truly amazing is how the platelets work. Platelets are small pieces of cell material, or cytoplasm, whose job it is to plug holes in the vessel walls. So, say you're standing inside the blood vessel and looking at the tear in its wall, you'd see millions of platelets responding to the injury, throwing themselves over the cut. They stick to the wound's edges and to each other to form a plug that slows the loss of blood within three to five minutes. A platelet plug will last for only 24 to 72 hours because the platelets run out of energy and begin to fall apart. But as long as there is still an unhealed hole in the blood vessel wall, the clot will continue being formed, dissolved, and reformed to stop and prevent more bleeding from occurring. When the wound is completely healed by the new cells growing over it, the clot will be cleared away and blood will begin to flow through the vessel normally. So function of blood is transport. That's number one, transporting oxygen, nutrients from the digestive tract, waste that are given off from our cells, carbon dioxide that's given off from our cells, and the hormones that we produce in our endocrine glands and distribute throughout the rest of the body. So important major role is transportation, working with the heart as the pump to move that blood throughout the body. Um, we also have components in our blood that are part of our immune system, so the white blood cells can encapsulate and um, destroy bacteria and other foreign objects or foreign antigens, they're called, that enter the body. So we also have some cells that produce antibodies, which are small proteins that bind to cells, um, foreign cells, and or debris, um, antigen, and disable it. If it's a cell that can, if it's, a, say, a viral particle, like the chickenpox virus, an antibody can bind to those cells that are infected and destroy them. So looking at um, other functions, we also know that blood is important for protecting us from blood loss by forming clots, and that's the role of the platelets. <clears throat> so red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets are the cells of the blood, the whole uh, formed elements, the solid part of our blood. Other functions of blood is um, maintaining our body temperature, keeping us warm, and we find that arteries and veins lie very close to one another in our body as it transports blood and that keeps the temperature of our blood relatively the same and the surrounding tissues. And also we have a pressure of fluid in our blood vessels that is important, um, that blood helps to maintain and there's just proteins suspended in our blood that holds fluid in our blood vessels. It's called albumin. Albumin is an important plasma protein. It's a blood protein that holds water in our blood and keeps our blood pressure um, within homeostasis. And then we have buffers pleasant, present in our blood, and buffers are just um, special molecules, our ions, that help to maintain blood pH, keeping it from our blood from becoming too acidic or too basic. So the range for normal blood um, pH is 7.35 to 7.45. So 7.4 falls right in the middle. So it's a liquid connective tissue and the fluid part of blood is called plasma. And as some of you know, that's a light yellow liquid. It suspends all these cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, 
and we can donate our plasma because there's a lot of comp important components of plasma. If we look at the plasma, if we spin our blood down and get all those formed elements down at the bottom here, as shown in this vial, we can see plasma is just about over half of our blood volume, and it's mostly water, but there's also proteins such as albumins, which we said are good for maintaining blood pressure, globulins are antibodies, and fibrinogen is an important clotting protein to keep us from um, having extended bleeding. There's also other solutes such as ions that we're going to talk about like sodium, potassium, chloride, nutrients that we absorb from our digestive tract, waste products, gases, hormones, and vitamins. So oxygen and carbon dioxide are the two important gases we find dissolved in the plasma. So we said it's 91% water, so when we want to maintain our blood pressure and have a nice volume of plasma, it's good to be well hydrated. If we lose fluid from our digestive tract after a lot of you know, vomiting or diarrhea, obviously if that continues, that could cause a reduction in plasma, which would then um, reduce the blood pressure. So those plasma proteins we already mentioned, albumin is really important for maintaining blood pressure. Globulins are those antibodies that help us fight infection. Fibrinogen is important for blood clotting. Red blood cells, that's what transports oxygen and uh, some carbon dioxide in the blood. So it's capable of transporting both carbon dioxide and oxygen. It has a special protein called hemoglobin that binds oxygen and it also gives blood its red color. So we know that when people have um, well oxygenated blood, they have a healthy color to their skin and if they're low on oxygen, they get a bluish or pale appearance to the skin. Some people even say people start to look gray as that um, hemoglobin and oxygenation in the tissues decreases. So here's what red blood cells look like. They don't have a nucleus when they enter into the bloodstream after being formed in the bone marrow and they are collapsed in the center because of a lack of nucleus. So they go through our capillaries, our smallest of vessels, single file, one at a time. And they don't actually leave the capillary. They, the only thing that leaves the capillary and enters the surrounding tissues are the components of plasma. And that's what we need to maintain life. We don't want red blood cells entering into the tissues because that's what a break in a blood vessel will cause. And that causes a, a bruised appearance to the skin when red blood cells are leaking out underneath the skin. So we know that red blood cells are produced in the red bone marrow. So that's inside of our bones are where these red blood cells are produced and they only live about three to four months. So three months is the average and after a while they break down, their, their um, cell membranes you know, break and they are then removed from circulation by macrophages we find in the liver and also the spleen. So that's an important, those are important organs for maintaining um, a normal red blood cell count. So the fact that they're kind of flattened in the middle allows them to get through those small uh, capillaries, but they have a nice surface area for the gases, carbon dioxide, and oxygen to diffuse um, out of the red blood cells or into the red blood cells, depending on if it's carbon dioxide or oxygen. If we need more red blood cells um, in our blood, there is a hormone called erythropoietin that is produced by the kidneys that will increase red blood cell production in the bone marrow. And this happens when there's reduced oxygen levels in the blood. For example, if a person goes hiking at a high altitude, there's less oxygen at those altitudes and that's gonna stimulate EPO or erythropoietin um, release from the kidneys to act on the, uh, the red bone marrow to release and incre increase and release more red blood cells into the bloodstream. Um, even uh, certain lung conditions can cause a reduction in oxygen and result in EPO. For example, COPD is a chronic state of low oxygenation in patients you know, with advanced disease. And as a result, they have chronically higher numbers of red blood cells because of increased EPO um, release from the kidneys, um, stimulating more red blood cell production. And if we have more, too many red blood cells, that can cause clotting and poor blood flow because the blood is, doesn't have enough plasma and it has too many of those formed elements, those red blood cells, and that's going to impair blood flow and feeding plasma, all the components of plasma to the tissues. So it's a serious condition. <clears throat> blood doping is uh, something that athletes have used by injecting EPO um, or taking removing blood prior to an athletic competition and then um, stimulating the body's natural ability 
to release EPO and increase blood cell production. And then they give that blood back, this is done by a doctor, then they give that blood back closer to the event so they have double or whatever the number, increased percentage of red blood cells. And one, of the, one athlete that has been um, caught using blood doping as a way to get, to get in a competitive advantage is uh, Lance Armstrong, who is the biker. <clears throat> So I think he had to give back the Tour de France medal after being caught um, blood doping. So here we can just see um, as blood oxygen levels decline, it stimulates the kidneys to release erythropoietin to the bloodstream, which acts on cells of the red bone marrow to increase red blood cell production. We have more red blood cells to carry oxygen, and that will bring our oxygen levels up. So other uh, disorders involving the blood, jaundice is when we have too much of the byproduct of hemoglobin after red blood cells die, they release, they release um, heme, a component of hemoglobin, into the bloodstream and the liver will process out that heme. But if the liver is diseased, it's not able to do that, or if we have an excess number of um, red blood cells that are destroyed and releasing, releasing heme into the bloodstream, we get a yellowing color to the skin and eyes, and that's called jaundice. Sometimes newborn babies have jaundice because their livers are immature, and it just takes a little time for the, livers to, to, for the liver to mature and process that heme. So we know that heme breaks down in sunlight or, or UV light, so we'll put those babies with newborn jaundice under some UV lights in the uh, hospital, and or a blanket will be sent home with the family that has lights embedded into it, and that'll help increase the breakdown of that heme in the bloodstream while the liver is you know, further developing and catching up with that function. Anemia is not having enough red blood cells or having too little hemoglobin production. So often it's caused by a deficiency in iron. So some people um, need to take an iron supplement to get um, enough hemoglobin or red blood cells to maintain homeostasis. Um, sometimes people lose it through surgery. They have too much blood loss and they just lose red blood cells as a result of surgery. So they need a blood transfusion where we actually give red blood cells back to the patient as a result of blood loss during surgery or in a traumatic accident. Another type of anemia is called pernicious anemia. Some people lack vitamin B12, which is needed to make red blood cells. So as a result, they need vitamin, P, vitamin B12 injections in order to make um, red blood cells and to have the, uh, an adequate number of red blood cells to maintain homeostasis. So um, pernicious anemia is a condition that will be a problem throughout life and it's due to the lack of an important um, secretion in the stomach that helps us absorb vitamin B12. So some people are just born with a condition in which they cannot absorb vitamin B12 because they lack a specific factor in their stomach called intrinsic factor. <clears throat> and then folic acid deficiency anemia, we need folic acid to make red blood cells as well. So if we don't get enough folic acid in our diet, that too can lead to anemia. But the most common is the iron deficiency anemia. Other types of anemia is hemolytic anemia, where the red blood cells simply burst and, and die before the 120 days. And sickle cell disease is when the red blood cells have a funny shape in low oxygen conditions. They become sickle shaped as shown in this picture. They become, instead of round, they become kind of curved and flattened. And as a result, there's a lot of clotting that occurs in those capillaries because those red blood cells aren't running through a single file. They're getting caught up. Multiple of these sickle shaped red blood cells are getting caught up in the capillary and causing a clot and, and impaired blood flow. That's an inherited disease that needs a lot of management throughout life. So the white blood cells are gonna be part of our next unit on the uh, immune system. We'll talk more in more detail about white blood cells, but for now, all I'd like you to know is that they're very large cells compared to the red blood cells. They're much less numerous. They only account for about 1% of our whole blood. So it's a very small amount, one less than 1% at that. So it's a small amount um, of our blood but a very important in component because it is a, um, our immune system. So white blood, blood cells are also produced in the red bone marrow 
and then they're released and they live for days, some live for months, and others live for years, depending on the type of white blood cell. So there's a number of white blood cells, um, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes. And you can see each of them has its own unique function. Uh, the monocytes are important for being a, a phagocyte, which means it can leave the bloodstream, enter the tissues, and actually you know, destroy um, bacteria and debris in the infected tissues. Lymphocytes produce antibodies and they're good for controlling viruses. Neutrophils are like uh, the macrophages. They also can phagocytose um, debris and, in and cells in infected tissues. And eosinophils and basophils, we see those in higher amounts in those with allergic um, reactions or allergies. So they play a role in inflammation related to allergic reactions. So we can see that the white blood cells, like a monocyte, can actually leave the bloodstream and enter the tissues. So it kind of squeezes between the cells of our capillary wall and enters the tissues to clean up the debris and fight that infection. So when you look at dis disorders involving the white blood cells, we have immunofficiency diseases where some people just don't develop white blood cells. Others have leukemia, leuko means white, and emia means blood. So leukemia means white blood. Essentially, we have a, a proliferation or an overgrowth of white blood cells in the bone marrow and bloodstream, and, it, and they're abnormal, they don't function well, they don't fight disease. So people with leukemia often complain of bone pain as they have um, excess white blood cells in the red bone marrow causing pressure and pain. And they also have impaired immune function. They'll you know, develop fevers and be ill a lot. So um, as those white blood cells um, overpopulate and crowd out the red blood cells, they'll also have um, anemia. And that's what brings people to the hospital and they can lead and will lead to a diagnosis of leukemia. The good news is childhood leukemia is very treatable nowadays, more so than it ever was in the past. So with early detection, kids with childhood leukemia often survive. <clears throat> Mononucleosis is an infection of the white blood cells. It's a virus, the Epstein-Barr virus, and it's spread uh, most commonly through saliva. So siblings living in close contact, um, members of an athletic team that are sharing water bottles can sometimes get hit with this virus. You can have more than one person infected, and it results in fatigue, sore throat, swollen lymph nodes, and often in enlarged spleen. And as a result, they have to avoid contact sports until they recover from mono. Platelets, as the video dis uh, discussed, are fragments of cells. I think the video calls them being made up of cytoplasm. That's not accurate. Actually, they are fragments of cells called megakaryocytes, but they're not true cells because they're simply little pieces of cells. And their important role is in blood clotting or co blood coagulation. So that's important for um, stopping bleeding. And we also have some plasma proteins, prothrombin and fibrinogen that are part of the clotting process. And vitamin K is an important vitamin we take in through our diet that also helps with blood clotting because it helps us form this prothrombin. So people that have clotting disorders um, or have recently had surgery, we kind of want to uh, fight this clotting tendency in those patients, and then we send patients home um, on injectable blood thinners like um, Lovenox is a popular one that people will go home with after having hip or knee surgery. Um, also, in the hospital, we give people heparin, which is more uh, fast-acting, and we'll give them that to prevent blood clots while they're in the hospital. But with normal uh, physiology, blood clotting is an important thing that we need to stop bleeding when we bump ourselves or, or have a small you know, leak in some capillaries, which happens you know, pretty common throughout the body. So this just shows the process in which um, a blood clot is formed. So you have some rupture in a blood vessel, so you cut yourself. Um, the platelets that are, that are passing by that cut area will form a platelet plug, and if it's a small cut, like a paper cut, that's all that will happen. But if the cut is larger than that, then it takes a couple of more of these proteins, the prothrombin and fibrinogen, with the help of calcium ion, to form a fibrin thread, which will lead to a blood clot. So we have the fibrinogen converts from a 
from a dissolved substance to a solid substance called fibrin, and it forms a mesh-like structure over that broken blood vessel, and then the blood vessel can heal. Over time, as the blood vessel heals, then that clot needs to go away. We don't want to keep clots in our blood vessels, so there's another enzyme that comes into play called plasmin, and that will break down that clot and allow that vessel to completely heal, and then as a result, the, the clotting process is over and normal blood flow returns to that damaged vessel. So here we can see kind of a close-up picture of what fibrin looks like with some blood vessels, or I'm sorry, with some red blood cells caught up in that blood clot. So when you look at blood clotting, sometimes people have too few of platelets and they end up with something called thrombocytopenia. So we get too few of platelets being produced and the problem with that is excess bleeding. So leukemia can cause that, again, because those white blood cells are crowding out the production of thrombocytes or platelets. So a thrombocyte is a platelet. And certain drugs like heparin, if someone's on heparin, that can induce a thrombocytopenia and cause excess bleeding. So it's a very serious condition. We already talked about forming blood clots unnecessarily, so that's called a thrombus or an embolism. If, it's a, if it stays in place, it's called a thrombus. If it travels to another organ and causes a blockage somewhere else where it was formed, we call that an embolism. And we talked about pulmonary embolism as a common you know, blood clot that forms and gets stuck in a distant site, which would be the lungs. And then hemophilia is an inherited blood disease in which we don't, those individuals don't produce a clotting factor in the plasma, and as a result, they can't form uh, clots and they have excess bleeding. So in our next video, uh, we're going to talk about human blood types.